Welcome to Drinking Bros, folks. It's uh, Friday of some week. I don't remember when, Giorgio. Uh, today we have a special guest, one that I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, Stephen Kotler is the author of Stealing Fire and other books. And uh, glad to have you today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling in. It's good to be with you. Absolutely. What do you got going on lately? Writing another book or what are you doing some research? Are you just hanging out? What's going on? Uh, so there's a brand new book, The Art of Impossible, came out a month ago. So uh, I think we hit a, about 10 bestseller lists like a couple weeks back. Oh, wow. Um, uh, I'm working on another book. I'm researching a third and I'm editing uh, and about to publish a fourth. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So you got a lot of shit going on is what you're saying. Yeah. That's, Good. you know, besides the company and everything else that's going on, that's what's going on. Right. Yeah, of course. Of course. Well, that's good to hear, man. I mean, look, I, I've been a big uh, fan of Stealing Fire. It's actually um, my former boss, the CEO of Black Rifle Coffee, who our audience knows really well. He's a former Green Beret, um, worked for the CIA for a while uh, doing operation stuff. And he's always been a big fan of your work as well, just unlocking human potential and, you know, kind of shedding some of the, uh, uh, I guess, I, I don't know what you would call it. People feel a certain way about these drugs. In the same way, I feel like there's an analog between... Uh, TRT testosterone replacement and then the black eye that that testosterone got with the whole baseball scandal and then I feel like there's a big misunderstanding about psychotropic drugs and their application particularly with your brain and how it affects you I mean there's all these stupid myths right like that you take acid and then turn into a, a cup of orange juice and you're afraid to tip over we've always heard these stupid wife wives tales over the years no no that's not stupid that happened to me no, no I took it <laughs> <and I turned laughs> into <laughs> <laughs> it's great yeah it's funny uh so you know no, I, I actually think you, I think you started with a really interesting comparison okay. um, in that uh, when I, 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 psychedelics people, they get gussied up with a lot of junk on top of them. That stuff makes me crazy, Right. but I've been covered and I came into psychedelics. I covered the dr drug war as a journalist. Mm. Like I didn't come in as a psychedelic advocate, I came in as a guy covering the drug war right. in all its aspects. In the 1990s, the drug war went from whatever it was focused on to MDMA, mm. and I, you know, I was already aware of the like the clinical of applications of MDMA before it sort of started to get criminalized. So that was what like caught my attention. I was like, well, this is puzzling. It doesn't like how could a drug that was like created for marriage counseling and has been deadly effective suddenly be a Schedule One? You know, that was what caught my attention. Um, it led me into psychedelics further, but it also led me into steroids. I wrote a, a, what I think is now a fairly famous article called Sympathy for the Devil, Why Everything mm -hmm. You Know About Steroids is Wrong. Yep. And um, they were, they're just two classes of substances where the medical community has been entirely untruthful for a variety of reasons. Um, and steroids as well, where people have just been massively untruthful. And even with the stuff that like, that came out of the, the powerlifting community has been massively, everybody, right. every, nobody was telling the truth about any of these substances. Um, they're near their miracle cures, nor, you know, uh, the devil's poison for right, that of course, yeah. metaphor. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, but it's, that's kind of how it goes, right? I mean, uh, I, I'm sure I, I would imagine you've read the master switch by Tim Wu. It seems like a book you may have read uh, just the way he goes through the years and, and points out how often the government uh, and big institutions have been complicit in creating monopolies and boxing out real stuff for mostly for uh, s some ideology or for profit or whatever it happens to be, or stability, even as they see it. Uh, and a lot of things, I mean, uh, Rogan's done quite a bit of uh, discussion on, the timber industry and its effect on cannabis and things like that. And, you know, we, it's weird. I, I believe that NBMA was legal until like 1988 or something like that. I don't remember exactly what year it was criminalized, but for a long time, it was, as you said, it was being used as, uh, as essentially a supplement. Right. Uh, and so my, they were, it, it had, it showed there were benefits for quote unquote weight loss. I don't like that came out of an early study, right? Somebody found benefits right. for weight. Like, I don't even know well, what it's, they were it's an, to study. It's an amphetamine, it's an amphetamine. Right? So course, No, yeah. I get it. But like, that's just, <laughs> could you imagine like you signed up for a weight loss study and you had <laughs> know, to get right? MDMA, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, love you, man. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you could lose weight that way, I guess. Hugging, <laughs> hugging. Way. Yeah. Hugging, hugging. At, yeah, it, that was just, um, I knew MDMA was very, was also being, um, I knew a lot of the people in and around the Texas scene and the San Francisco scene mm. 
um, with it a little bit. It was this, the same, you know, group. Uh, there was a very similar group of psychologists who have been, you know, involved in all in all these substances mm. therapeutically, and you know, those that's the same kind of group that you know ended up becoming Maps that Rick Dobler, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, all that stuff. And I've known those guys forever. Mm. Um, yeah, it's great. That's great. And I, I like, uh, you know, just the it, it's these days you can see it in, in public every day. Uh, scientists aren't um, I, I feel like it's they're almost used as pawns in a lot of ways. I mean, but it's, it, we're, we're just completely uh, affected as Americans right now by confirmation bias. Everybody's picked a side and they're all just trying to pick and choose things to to fit their narrative. And it seems like very few people are actually looking at, like you said, you started covering the drug war to cover the drug war because you're a journalist, but you discovered things. And if you with, look, if you're the kind of person that new information doesn't create a new opinion or a new belief, that's a problem, right? I mean, you, that, that's the whole, that's the Socratic method. You, you have a belief, you test it. If it's wrong, yeah, you that was, by it. the way, one of the reasons I couldn't understand why people were mad at John Kerry for being a flip flopper, right? I was yeah, like, right, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, that's the side of intelligence. Like you go yeah. out, you learn something, you change your mind. Right. Okay. I trust you. It's the guy who's like, no, no, no. I, 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 I stand by my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like your whole life. Really? Yeah. You're talking like, about in the, in the 2004 election, he got lit yeah, up for that well, all yeah. the time. Yeah. I don't remember who, yeah. who he was. Bush was your, yeah, yeah, it was George Bush. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He got, but he I got just, I like that, whatever yeah. you want politics aside, I just, it was the flip flopper thing. I was like, wait a minute. Like that's just the sign of an intelligent human being that you go out, you learn stuff and you, you're allowed to change your opinion. Yeah. We're romantic about the weirdest things like, Oh, it's, uh, we just all have always done it that way. I mean, that's the death stroke for a business to say things like that. That's crazy to talk like that. Um, I, and I don't understand it now. I, your, your work, I, I've read, uh, all, except for the new one, I've read all your books, but I am particularly interested in Stealing Fire because of, well, one, it, it's a lot of my personal experience starting very young. I had some issues with uh, Spectrum stuff and was, you know, kind of self-medicating using psilocybin and LSD and things like that. And then when I read your book, I guess it was 2017, I believe I read it. Um, I was like, wow, these, there's a lot of stuff in here that I experienced anecdotally that I'm now seeing pop up research. And it, it hit home even more because I'm a veteran. I was an infantryman in the 82nd Airborne. So we do, you know, a lot of, a lot of crazy stuff. And I read a lot about how the special operations community was using stuff like this and then how Silicon Valley were using basically the same tactics. Now, if those two very disparate communities can do something and achieve a beneficial effect on both ends, then you know there's legitimacy to what's happening, right? I... I don't know how to answer that question because I've known there's legitimacy. You know what I mean? I've spent correct, of, years, of course, right? Yeah, you know, in the in the in this in this world. Um, so I'm really confident in that. I'm, you know, it's it's not really. I've I've said this for a long time. I've been in every room you could possibly be in with everybody you could possibly be, and I've never once bumped into a conspiracy theory or a cover up or anything else like that. The only thing I've ever seen is smart people trying to solve complex problems badly right. and then covering up their mistakes afterwards. Right. right? Yeah. I've seen yeah. that. I've seen a lot of, a lot of that, but as a general rule, the biggest problem, like, especially, you know, when you start dealing with my work, which, which is really about altered states of consciousness, um, predominantly flow for performance enhancement. This was a really, really radical idea for a very, very long time um, for two or three main reasons. The first, it, like one of the big problems we have with a lot of these ideas goes back to Freud. Mm -hmm. William James, kind of godfather of psychology, first American psychologist wrote the original textbook on it, said, hey, we psych psychology should study everything. Positive states, negative states, the whole spectrum of human experience, blah, blah, blah. Freud came along and said, no, no, no. Psychology's job is to fix pathological problems. That's mm -hmm. what we do here. And for, you know, about a hundred years, that is essentially what psychology did. And it does it in, a, it, in psychology and neuroscience. It did it in a very balkanized way. And mm -hmm. the biggest problem is that nobody's looking at the big picture. That's one of the reasons I have a career, right? Like I got into this work. It's not that, you know, I'm smarter than anybody. It's that the nature of what I was doing for a living 
first starting with journalism, then writing books, then running my own neurobiology research company, I was looking at the big picture. That was exactly what we were right. looking at and you know, starting to piece the puzzle together. So that's what, what I saw more than anything else is science is extremely balkanized and it's extremely competitive. People don't understand mm. that. Like they think like football is competitive, basketball is competitive. I'm like, no, no, you don't. Go to a neuroscience conference, see what happens there and then have that opinion. Like they hug each other after football games. Right, you know, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when, when you're constantly competing for funding, it's gotta be, I mean, th that is a very stressful situation to be in. And, and uh, I mean, aside from any of the negative things like pride of authorship or anything like that, that you're absolutely right, it's very competitive. And, and in some cases it should be, right? But as even as a scientist, you should constantly be trying to disprove yourself to make sure you're on the right track. It's just, you know, challenging your beliefs and things like that. And I think um, you've done a really good job of, of co organizing a lot of information and then putting it in a format, particularly in this book, Stealing Fire, that is essentially undeniable. Now, it's still a bit taboo. And you're, the last chapter of the book goes through hedonic calendars and how to do things responsibly and all that stuff, which is, which is amazing. But... Uh, the, the, the data in the book is, it's not something that you can really argue about. It's, they're demonstrable things for, for oh, decades yeah. now. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny. I had, I had a conversation earlier today. Uh, I was uh, being interviewed by a, a top neurosurgeon and mm -hmm. he was talking a little about psychedelic, like same similar conversation. And he was trying, he's like, well, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you talk to the mainstream about this stuff? And I'm like, what are you talking about exactly? Like the mainstream is like, we've just legalized psychedelics in three or four States. I mm. believe that therapeutically what, you know, the work I do, which is, can they be used for peak, peak performance right. work? I, you know, that's a separate question. We'll come back to it in half a second, but ther therapeutically, if your interest is in anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, on and on and on, uh, fear of death, mm. you know, uh, related to terminal illness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OCD, ADHD, the, the list is long at this point, you know, the therapeutic value of psychedelics of cannabis, these it's extremely well proven. And I think it's extremely mains or getting to the point of fairly mainstream at this point, right. um, from a performance standpoint, you know, I don't do psychedelics. That's not the work I do at all. In fact, uh, I left my old company, the Flow Genome Project, to start mm. the Flow Research Collective because I don't want to do that work at all. Right. It's not It's not the work. I'm interested in the neurobiology of the flow. And we did some really interesting work uh, with Imperial College London where they've done all the brain scans mm. of, F, of, of all the psychedelic compounds from DMT through MDMA, you know, except, except for Robin Card Harris's lab. And we were looking at comparison and contrast between psychedelics and flow states for performance capabilities. And unless right. your interest is in, in the psychedelics will outperform flow for synesthesia, mm. so-called spiritual experiences and negative experiences. Right. Those are the three categories where psychedelics but monstrously outperform flow. Well, but that's absolutely that, true. Yeah. You know. But fl group flow, I mean, flow is, psychedelics can help treatment on the individual level, but it's, if the, the flow thing is probably, it's probably as, as important, if not more important, because ultimately in society, I mean, very rarely do you work alone in any kind of way, whether it's your personal life or business or social groups or whatever it is, obviously you're around other people and getting in flow states is super important for that. Right. But I would, I would say to add to what you're, what you said, just that, uh, uh, being in the flow is a form of therapy itself. We are deeply connected hu uh, oh, creatures sure. as human beings. Yeah, and no, and that, I mean, that's what they, you know, the, the, work on psychedelics with the, so we do the, we, we talk about this in stealing fire, right? We can mm -hmm. do a comparison for like PTSD. They, they ran three studies. They used uh, MDMA, mm -hmm. which one to two sessions of talk therapy plus MDMA usually is enough to significantly re relieve symptoms of PTSD, meaning people can reduce their meds or they can get off meds <laughs> entirely. Right. It was a month, uh, five weeks of surfing, for a, as a flow trigger plus talk hmm. therapy did the same thing Correct. and it was a month worth of uh i think it was daily 20 minutes a day meditation right did the same thing so um all three different ways of altering our consciousness all do similar things in the brain though right um very similar 
results. The way I think about the difference is this, the way we talk about this, you know, if I'm being really dramatic, I say, you know, back when I was a journalist on five separate occasions, somebody either, you know, pointed a gun in my face, shoved a gun in my mouth or was shooting at me. Right. At no point when that shit was going on, could I look at the dude and say, excuse me, can you put down the AK-47 right, while yeah. I use this substance <laughs> to pick up my performance and dodge your bullet? Right, right? Yeah. Like that, it doesn't happen that way in crisis situations, nor, you know, to make it a lot less dramatic and a lot more familiar when you hear, hey, honey, can you come in here for a minute? I need to talk. Oh, yeah. There's no time <laughs> for like a brain changing technology or substance, right? right? Yeah. It's peak performance time. It's right. go time right there. Right. And so I like to lean on things predominantly for peak performance that are physiological or psychological because they work anywhere, anytime, and you don't Correct. need, gear, right? For therapy, for trauma, for like, let's get you from broken back to, you know, normal. I'm, I think it's a different, you know, the calculus is really different with that. And this is not to say that a lot of people have a tremendous amount of success using psychedelics to stimulate creativity and for mm -hmm. a whole bunch of stuff. I just, they come with such a weird downside, like what they do to people's egos. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm running around and I'm channeling Norse gods. No, shut up, man. You're on yeah, drugs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just on drugs. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I really, I'm glad that you said that. That's funny to me. It's, it's like the, everybody is, is, enjoying something and getting a lot out of it and then there's one asshole who's you know obviously projecting themselves into everybody else's stuff it's super irritating sometimes i just uh, i just think you know all these whether it's flow any of these technologies that uh, will produce a lot of dopamine in your system right any of these narcissistic tendencies mm. right is like it, it's gonna it's gonna For cause sure. problems and it's gonna right. push them in a direction that is going to get increasingly annoying and eventually dangerous. Right. So we've been talking about, we, we got a good lead in now. We've been talking a little bit about uh, flow states and, uh, and uh, using some verbiage. Why don't you tell my audience what a flow state is from the perspective oh, yeah. of somebody who's yeah, an expert? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, they've yeah. heard all this before. So, I just want them to hear it from you, from your own personal no, experience. No, it's great. It's great. So uh, I'm going to give you four different levels of definitions so you can understand, you know, first, what does it mean? Scientifically, it flow is an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best, right? When psychologists define flow, they say, hey, if you have an experience that has these six characteristics, complete concentration in the present moment on the task at hand, the merger of action awareness, the diminishment of our sense of self and self-consciousness, time dilation, which is a fancy mm -hmm. way of saying time passes strangely, right? right? Slows down, speeds up. Uh, their performance and flow goes through the roof, but that's not, it's harder to measure. So they talk about a sense of control. You have a mm. feeling that you can control things that you normally can't control, right? This is the basketball player seeing a hoop as big as, you know, it's suddenly it's a gigantic hoop and everybody's playing in slow motion. And finally, the experiences themselves are autotelic. That's a fancy way of saying an end in itself, or it's a hell of a lot of fun, euphoric, ecstatic. The experience produces flow, will go really far out of a way to get more of it. That's psychologist measuring mm -hmm. flow. The work we do in my, in, in my lab and, and my team is we look at the neurobiology of flow. So what's going on in the brain and the body when we're in flow. Right. So you're looking, for, you're looking for like the best ways to get to that state the quickest or the most efficiently or I, whatever. I want, so psychology is great, useful tool, mm. right? Super, super useful, but it is essentially metaphor. Mm. And it's a metaphor for a mechanism, which is neurobiology. Mm. I want more of something or less of something, right? Right, yeah, of if course. From a big performance standpoint, I need to know what the mechanism is. Of course, so right. Give me the exactly. neurobiological mechanism. And uh, like, just let me put it in context with you. For you, uh, flow, if you go back into the 90s and the early 2000s, when people were really trying to train it from the psychology, and you don't have, like, you can look at Susan Jackson's flow in mm -hmm. sports. She wrote this with Mihai Chick Set Me High, the godfather of flow psychology, and they tried to use the psychology to train flow, and you can right. see the results, and they're yeah, bad. Yeah. yeah, they're not good. We, using neurobiology, we measure free flow pre and post using Susan Jackson's own tool for measuring flow, and at the Flow Research Collective, after a uh, eight week training, we're seeing a 70% increase in flow. Over, over what period? An eight week period. Um, wow. Our, we have, uh, we, we, the, our, they're, they're in, our courses are intense, mm -hmm. right? Don't get, me, don't get me wrong. And you go through with a PhD psychologist or neuroscientist as a mm -hmm. coach, 
So it's very hands-on. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work. We're seeing a 70, 80% boost in flow. In the beginning, it was hard to stabilize that. Mm. Um, we also have discovered you have to train up. There's some peak performance basics. There's some motivational stuff mm. you need. There's some goal setting stuff. But if you're, if you're doing all that work, it seems like it is a very trainable state. That's incredible. I mean, just to, I mean, ultimately you want to be able to, you know, you, you want to be able to switch on and switch off, I guess, for lack of a better phrase or stay switched on, I guess, whatever the case is. And if we, I like the, I like the way you detail that we're ultimately trying to get to the trigger point. Like what is it that's actually causing this? And that's where the the physical science uh, over the social science comes in. Like if, for example, yeah, if you were, I mean, like, Oh, let me just quickly, so your listeners understand this. Sure. Flow states have triggers, preconditions mm. that lead to more flow. This was the great discovery that made flow trainable. Mm. Here's the easy way to think about it. Flow follows focus. It only shows up when all our retentions are right here right now. There are 22 flow triggers. No, there are probably way more, but that's what we've discovered. All of them do the same thing. They drive attention to the present moment. If I were to put it formally, I'd say, hey, look, they drive norepinephrine or dopamine into our system. These mm. are performance enhancing focusing chemicals or they lower cognitive load. Cognitive load is all the shit right. you're trying to think Pre-frontal about. Prefrontal cortex, yeah, yeah, for sure. I lower cognitive load. Right. I, you liberate energy. You use that for focus. Boom. That's what all the triggers do. They do one or two or three of those things. Um, and if you can play with these triggers, right. Do that, drive attention to the present moment, you can have way more flow. I mean, it's almost like Kentucky Pretty windage simple. for your brain, if you're familiar with the phrase Kentucky windage. Uh, uh, it's, I'm it's not, like, but I it's, like uh, it. So you it's, gotta, a, it's just like Alabama chrome. Yeah, it's like when you're shooting, uh, you think there's some wind, you just, oh, I'll eyeball it, right? That's that's kind of how it is, but it's exactly. like you 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 know yourself. Like when you, as an athlete gets older, for example, they know their bat speed's a little slower if it's a baseball player, so they have to start their swing sure. a little bit earlier. You're just adjusting for the environment. Now, that's all really interesting, and and one of the things uh, that has been discussed a lot in flow state and triggering is that we had this for a very long time. Had this idea that the the mind controls the body, but what we found out is that just forcing yourself to smile, for example, the physiological effect from that will produce dopamine and put you in a better mood just by forcing yourself to do. That's very interesting, and it means yeah, you have a lot more control. Yeah, embodied cognition, yeah. which is sort of the the cutting edge of the work. You know, I always I always tell people that when you're talking about peak performance, even in the psychedelic realm, like there's it's a bounded set of knowledge right now. Like mm. people, we start sort of like at peak performance basics. We know what you have to do every day right. to kind of get into peak performance ring. These are the things for energy. These are the things mm. to like keep your anxiety levels down. Blah blah blah. And we go all the way up. We're starting. There's a just on flow. Um, we're at when we're moving flow and creativity into what I would call flow and innovation. Like how does this shit actually work inside a company, not just in individuals? That'd be the line, that's where that is. And on the biological side, like we, you know, we're sort of like epigenetics is, is the bottom line. And then that's where shit gets really confusing. If people tell you they think they know something about epigenetics or the microbiome, doubt them, right? And then on the upper level, it's sort of embodied cognition, which was what you and I are talking about and net neural dynamics. Right, mm -hmm. like how do networks in the brain and networks in the body and how they work together? Because you're right, it's not the brain driving the body. It's not the body driving the brain. It's an embodied system. In fact, it's also you're embed. You're also embedded in the environment, mm -hmm. which is where this stuff gets. You know, that's where embodied cognition gets really, really confusing because from a like a sensory organ perspective, like it's almost impossible to say where do you end, where does the rest of the world begin from a right. lot of like, even in terms of body maps, right? Like if you're a professional tennis player, you pick up a racket, your body instantly remaps your hand around the mm. racket. So it now includes the racket, right? right yeah, yeah. You shoot a lot, right? That's what happens. Right, as soon course, as you yeah. pick up a gun, your body redraws. It the feels like an of extension of your body. body. Exactly. Yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. And that's, that's because we have body maps in our brain that mm. map every bit of our senses to every, there's a, a sensory input and a motor right. output. There's, so there's two sets of maps. That's, that's insane. So with all that, with all that said and how, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, you're being fed both from the physiological side and the psychological side when it comes to this and they, they almost in a, in a symbiotic kind of situation, but sometimes to the detriment of one another. But I wonder what it is about 
What are the similarities between uh, meditation, uh, psychotropic drugs, risky behavior, and communal experiences like group flow? What, what is it about them that make them produce the same physical effects in your brain? Mm. So all of those experiences, we see deactivation in the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. So the executive function portion of the brain turns right. down. All of those experiences on a certain level are underpinned by the same core neural chemistry. Now, the vast okay. majority of psychedelics are serotonin dominant experiences that make use of the other neurochemistry, mm. dopamine, norepinephrine, and andamine, a lot less. Right. Uh, flow and uh, seems to be, the meditation is very serotonin dominant also. Flow is, flow is not. Serotonin may show up at the end of the experience, mm. maybe a little bit at the beginning, but so far, no, no real proof that serotonin exists in the core flow state itself. Mm. Um, though that could change at any minute and be hard to like, usually dopamine and serotonin are op oppositional, right, yeah. right. In a sense. And you never in the body, like for example, cortisol levels in flow. Right. Cortisol level, cortisol, we have parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. You have a little bit of cortisol in the system, but not too much. Cause when you have that, a little bit but not too much you get fine tuning mm. right it's like having two control knobs treble and bass exactly right. just one yeah. right yep. you can tune it better so you get this it's likely because dopamine and serotonin sort of oppose each other a little bit in the brain so it's likely you're getting like actually like dynamic tension between the two systems mm. that's probably what we're going to end up finding out much later but yeah so neurochemically you're seeing the same things in brain waves all these things drop our brain waves from normal beta which is where we are awake right. alert right now down to the alpha theta borderline yeah. right so those are those things are very similar where they start to really change now a couple of cool things about meditation so in meditation versus flow most of the prefrontal cortex seems to deactivate, right? But there's a right. middle of your brain. This is Judson Brewer's work at Yale on meditation. He found that in meditation, this portion of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex totally shuts down. Hmm. In flow, it seems to be active, if not hyperactive. Now there's conflicting data here, but why would that be? What does the medial prefrontal cortex do that hmm. doesn't need to show up in meditation, does need to show up in flow? And then it's sort of different depending on the psychedelic you're on it governs creative self-expression. When you're meditating, you're trying to forget the self and be right, one yeah. with nothing. You don't need to express yourself creatively. Flow is nonstop right. creative self-expression, right? right? Peak performance is another way of saying, you know, expert level creative self-expression, right? They're roughly the same in terms of what we're talking about neurobiology, right. biologically. So that seems to be one of the differences there. Um, the serotonin thing is an, another difference. And where it really gets different is, um, at the network level. All right, uh, and I would I could explain to you if you care. It's a little confusing. Yeah, it's no, go. Let's, neat. let's hear it. We'll we'll all figure right. it out, or we won't. So <laughs> if you way. look at like Robin Card Harris's lab where they did all the brain imaging of psychedelics, what you see right, yeah. is psychedelics form crazy connections all over the place. Right, every part of the brain talks to every part of the brain talks to every part of the brain, which is why like when you're tripping and you look over at the at the plant it turns from a plant into a giant, into a block, you know, it, right, yeah. one thing associate leads to the next, leads to the next. One way to think about this is like a search engine with a giant search space, right? Psychedelics widen out the entire search space and the search engine goes everywhere looking for things. Right. What happens in flow is same, it goes everywhere and finds all those connections, but the search space shrinks. And instead of this wide, anything goes, it's very focused on the task at hand. This is why flow is incredibly mm. useful and psychedelics may be useful, or maybe you're going to get a bunch of random information that just comes in because your brain is making. Right. Right. Well, well you've, you've said, things. you've said in most of your works uh, and on this subject that uh, even if you're, even if psychedelics do do for you what you need, they're not a replacement for talk therapy or for, you know, flow or for performance driven stuff either. That is a supplement to everything else. I mean, we, we think of I, like you, yeah, I agree. You, you said before, like um, people I, think it's a I, miracle I, drug or that it's not a miracle drug and it's not the devil. <clears throat> it's somewhere in between. It, it needs to be used that way. Right. Yeah. I, and I, I, I cautiously, cautiously is a weird thing. Cause I, like, I've never been cautious when I, I mean, I've done more psychedelics than anybody <laughs> could possibly imagine. I haven't done them in a lot of years. Cause now I sort of think, yeah, they're just a waste of time. There's nothing more I'm going right, to learn yeah. here. Right. And I don't know if I ever learned much in the first place. 
Um, and uh, as I said, the, psych the current psychedelic culture makes me freaking crazy. <laughs> like I, Robin Card Harris said the best thing about psychedelics, which I totally agree with. He said, look, from a biological point of view, every now and again, it's helpful to shake the snow globe. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean it's right. it's a like, it's a it's a reset. In the same way that it's yeah. helpful to get drunk sometimes. Right. You gotta just turn this shit off every right. now and again. I think that's to me, the biggest advantage of psychedelics for me, and this is just me, I'm an OCD, mm -hmm. ADHD, always on overdrive. It doesn't stop ever. And I don't like, you know, I started working today at three o'clock in the morning and I will go till I drop. Mm. And I'll do that every day, right? The only break I'm going to take is the break I take for to get a bunch of exercise. Right. And you know what I mean? That's just who I am. So psychedelics, the day after, you're spent. You're lying mm. on a couch. There's nothing you can do. To me, that's the ultimate advantage of psychedelics is they force me to take a day off afterwards. Right. That's a, so that's I don't a good... do them very often. But every, you know, once a year or so, yeah. I And it's, I don't think... You know, it's sort of nice to, for me to go, oh, wow, it's, I forget that the brain can do all this stuff. Right, yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. You know, that's yeah. interesting, right? I mean, it's like watching it's a movie you've seen a bunch of times again, and then you pick up something new in the movie. The second time and the third time you watch, you just start to make new connections. Hey, everyone. Papa G here. And I just got to interrupt Dan and Stephen Collar to talk about one thing. And that one thing is Ghost Bed. Um, you'll probably find out from Jesse uh, that I still haven't gotten new pants. But I am going to get a new bed. I'm saving up for a ghost bed. I'm using the promo code BROS to save 30% off site-wide and adding two luxury pillows. Uh, I love this thing. Uh, I, I break into the office at night, and sometimes I just stay over there because uh, there's the ghost bed from the Jack Session. I just love it so much. I don't even go home. I don't even know why I pay for my apartment anymore. I should just live at the studio. I'm sure you guys would probably like that more. But I do need to go home. I do. I, uh, I need to go home because spring is around the corner, and that means it's time to get your lawn back on track. I know, I know, the last thing anyone needs is another complicated or toxic lawn product. But Sunday isn't just another lawn care product. It's a customized, tailored lawn plan that works with nature. It takes the guesswork out and the unwanted chemicals out so you can grow a beautiful lawn that's better for people, pets, and the planet. We just braved this great Austin freeze. I don't know anyone out in Austin right now or around the country who's got a beautiful lawn. Sunday will help take you back. Sunday makes taking care of your lawn easier than ever. I just went to sunday.com, put in my home address, and their free lawn care analysis took care of the rest. It all happened in just seconds. Sunday uses soil and climate data to create a tailored nutrient plan so you get all the stuff your lawn needs and nothing it doesn't. Sunday is made from ingredients that you can actually pronounce, like seaweed, iron, and molasses, so you can grow a better lawn and feel better about it. Sunday explains exactly what you need and why, and everything is waiting for you at your door when you need it. All I had to do was attach the ready-to-use pouches to the garden hose and spray. Lawn care used to take up an entire day for me, and now it takes about 15 minutes. Best of all is the stuff really works. My grass looks better than ever, and I have the best, I have the best grass in the lot, and it's all because of Sunday. Um, let Sunday take the guesswork out of growing a greener lawn for you as well, and we'll all have a more beautiful lawn this spring. Go to sunday.com slash drinking bros and you get twenty dollars off your custom lawn plan at checkout that's twenty dollars off your custom lawn plan at get sunday.com slash drinking bros again that is get sunday.com slash drinking bros and i'll get you twenty dollars off your lawn plan and that's 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 the that's that's the best i mean why how can you not put a price on a, a better lawn Go out there and, and get Sunday, guys. Uh, I, do it for me because Papa G loves you. The other thing that I find really fascinating about the experience from just like a geek perspective mm. is we know this isn't in Stealing Fire. It should have been, I think, but uh, it was just one detail too many, I think. We hallucinate in only six basic patterns. Like there are six things we see and everything we see corresponds to like a particular breakdown. For example, 
between V1 and, of the brain, which is the visual system, visual mm -hmm. cortex one and visual cortex two, that's edge recognition, right? Yeah. Right. Meaning the out. So if edge recognition goes away, everything swirls. Why do yeah. things swirl on right, yeah. acid and yeah. mushrooms? Because edge recognition is fucked right. up. Yeah, right? of course. So yeah. I like from that, from a geek perspective, it's really interesting to watch the brain and go, oh, this is what's breaking down here. Yeah, yeah. This that's is one why of, this is happening. That's, that's definitely that's, one of my favorite things too. Like, on, uh, I, it's fun. One of my favorite things to talk about too, because everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people give the same explanation of what doing DMT has felt like for them. Um, you know, like maybe they've been grabbed by the collar and just lifted up in the air behind themselves. And it's almost like an out of body experience. You know, it changes the, the way you're seeing things, your, your optical nerves are fucked with. So it looks like it's just almost well, that's, like reverse yeah, well, force are, perspective. You, the lattices, right? Yeah, yeah. You, okay, yeah, yeah. you get lattices, which is in one of the things you get spirals and lattices predominantly on DMT, which is something right, else yeah. the brain does, right? Those are, those are various other things. Fascinating. I, I like DMT because you know, as a guy, you know, I sort of think that like, you know, uh, my ADD is sort of like a superpower. <laughs> like, it can be right. Yeah. With, 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 with psychedelic psychedelic with DMT and with like action sports speeds when I'm skiing or something like that, if I'm like, finally life is now taking place at the speed that I've been trying to live forever. Right. Exactly. That's yeah. like, there's a little bit of a relief there where I'm like a finally life caught up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's uh, for uh, it is certainly like that for me. You mentioned um, uh, uh, getting your, or shaking the slow globe for yourself once a year and you go into it, I believe, in the, the next to last or the last chapter of Stealing Fire about how, um, you know, you need to figure out what's everything is different for everybody. So figure out what's best for you if you need it once a month, once a year, once every five, whatever it happens to be. For me, I'm like you, I work hard. And when I'm not working, I'm still thinking about working. You know what I mean? I'm just trying. And it's not always professional work. It's just, I'd like to learn things, right? And then right. you, I'm a, I'm a classic introvert, but I work, I do the work that I do. We do live events. We're around bands and stuff all the time. And it drains the energy out of me. And I find that getting back to these things, even if I'm uh, using DMT or psilocybin and I'm just like, you're talking about nerding out and analyzing the effects they're having on my body. I still find that I make a lot of forward progress and just almost like a net -a sketch just shaking it. Right. I didn't lose the fundamentals I, of who I am, but I reset a little bit. I found for, this is totally personally for me. I stopped doing a lot applying with a lot of, I also found that I, I'm an extreme introvert. Um, and even though I do a lot of public stuff as well, mm -hmm. it does the same thing. And even if I'm doing a lot of like talking on the phone or Zoom, yeah, yeah, for sure. whatever, I find that once every uh, two to three months, I, I take like a two or three day ski trip by myself. Mm. I talk to nobody, right? I like, uh, I ski alone. I, I read, I talk to no one. I ski. I now, you know, that's not all that different from my normal life. But like right. I, that t I have to like not talk to my wife, not talk to my fan, not nobody. And that seems to be as a fact, that's the best way for me to shake the snow globe these days yeah i mean that's uh i, I feel the same it, it, it really helps me and uh oftentimes i mean this is goofy but i'll just i'll stay in my place all weekend and just talk to my dogs like they're fucking human beings you know what i mean not that i don't i do it to some degree but I, it's not like i sit there and have full-on conversations with them but they are the only living creatures whose voices or who hear First my voice all, you know i don't know if you know this my, my wife and i run an animal a dog sanctuary oh no i didn't so, know that yeah we we do hospice care and special needs care mm. for uh, uh really old sick dogs um and uh so yeah i mean i'll i'll go like it is not unusual for me to go three or four months talking to nobody but my wife yeah and dogs, yeah exactly right? Yeah, that's that's my that's, that's my dream life. <laughs> you know what I mean? But obviously you can't uh, always do that. Can't, stuff, no, so. I, like I try like once I usually when I'm writing a book, there's usually a period of time. It's usually like the first edit mm -hmm. like the, when I turn it into my publisher, I'll right. do like 40 edits ahead of that. But that first edit, I like it's a two month process. Right. Leave me alone. Don't talk to me. I don't like you know. That's when I, you know, turn my company over to my CEO and I really become the executive director. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, From afar. Sure, yeah. 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 That's, that's uh, what a relief, right? Every time I start uh, some new company and then I get to that point in the growth of the company where I'm starting to hand off responsibilities to other people, it's, uh, it's, man, it's the best time of year, really. It's like Christmas for me. I love that stuff. It's, it's hard to, uh, it is hard to 
to, to go through all that stuff without some kind of, and people do it different ways, right? Some people need time alone. Some people need time in groups, obviously extroverts oh, do, really? uh, you know, and that, that brings us, uh, back to the group flow stuff. So I've, I have a lot of friends who are tier one military operators, you know, the best of the best that do what they do. And I've heard, uh, some, uh, some of the stuff you've written, some stuff, other people have written one experience of. Uh, so researchers being up on the catwalk while dev groups, SEAL Team 6, whatever you want to call them, are moving through shoot houses and things like that. And the comment was, it seems like it's choreographed. These guys aren't talking to each other. They're not even using hand and arms. Oh, yeah. it, They're it moving as a single it, I mean, it, It's so funny. I was having the same exact conversation mm -hmm. earlier today with the same neuroscience mm -hmm. as I was talking to about the exact same thing. It came up in the same way. But being in the rafters in the kill house, right. you can... I, what I was talking about is the exact opposite. It looks choreographed. And how do you know if somebody's not in flow? Because right. it's the dancer who's not in the... He's exactly. The one, yeah, he's yeah. The, so clear. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, that that dude is the odd man out. Right. Like, it's just so clear. Um, it's interesting, too, because, like, for example, the new book, The Art of Impossible, what mm. do we been doing? Um, it's the penetration of that book, like, Stealing Fire went i think everywhere in the military but especially yeah. in the elite communities but yep. like i'm seeing the art of possible like the national guard is starting to adopt it wow. and things like that and it's so it's moving into that level of it mm. and that's really interesting too because that's a whole different like you're going from guys in the teams who are all they do 24 hours right, a day yeah, yeah. is how do you be prepared how do you be and to the guard where it's like I've got a life in the military. I've got a life outside the military. I've got, and it's same challenges. They still need flow to perform at their best. And good God, in crisis situations, we need the guard, right? right? Yeah, we course. definitely, right? Like, don't don't kid yourselves. Yeah. Coast Guard, National Guard, like we need their help. Yeah. Um, but how do you train them into readiness? These are really, this, these are questions I've been uh, we've been working on a lot of the Flow Research Collective lately because of the new book because of the new book. Um, and and those questions it's re i'm really excited about the yeah, work. yeah. It's really we're also doing a lot of work this is interesting so one of the things about flow is as, as you know is it increases empathy perspective mm -hmm. taking and empathy over right. time well right? you lose the self so right when that front part of the brain shuts down you stop thinking about yourself and you stop sol you start solving problems right it That's also like so the temporal parietal junction is the mm -hmm. part of your brain that does perspective taking it's mm. also the same part of your brain that does out-of-body experiences. So like cognitive perspective mm. and physical perspective are the same part of the brain. Mm. <laughs> this part gets hyperactive in flow, in psychedelic. It's, why do you think people have out-of-body experiences? On this? Right, exactly. This yeah. part of the brain gets yeah. really shaken up. But this same part of the brain is the part that empathy is just seeing things from other people's perspectives, right? So it's the same part of the brain that's involved. Yes, those are in the mirror neurons and a whole bunch of other stuff, but it's this part of the brain that gets active. We've been doing a lot of work with the cops, mm -hmm. San Francisco Police Department, a bunch of other police departments, because not only do they want to be more effective cops from a performance standpoint, they want more empathy right, right now, for sure. Right, like they're desperate for more empathy. So that's really interesting. This is the first time I've seen, um, and I'm hardened by this, by the way, that our definition of peak performance, by the way, now includes empathy. I think mm -hmm. that's cool. I think it should, right? Of course it should. Yeah. I mean, we're ultimately, we all live in, if you want to go live in the woods by yourself, go do it. But if you're going to live in town and live in society, then you better goddamn be empathetic. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. It's not about... Uh, a capit it's, it's not about capitulating it's not about i don't know why i don't know how we came as a society to associate strength and power and masculinity with with uh uh, uh like violence and stuff like that it is meant to like the it, from a biological standpoint it is meant to protect first the individual and then the group right that's the entire purpose so people think maybe it's weak to be empathetic that is completely antithetical to what the biological nature of strength really is it doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't, I'm a military dude and I, I, I talk to my military friends about this all the time and they all feel the same. You can ask any of these yeah, people I mean, when, what, I, when they I, first I, like join are, the military. As a general, almost, as a general, general okay. rule, do you know anybody who's actually, you would classify as a, as, a, as a tough guy or tough woman who actually believes violence is any, any form of a solution? I like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like it's only to me, Strength is about empathy. Weakness, mm -hmm. if violence is the first thing you're turning to, you're a weak 
ass person. Yeah, like, that's like, like, a, like I'm so a, unimpressed. A dog that's confident where he is is pretty nice to everybody. But you back him into a corner, it's fear that causes the violence typically, yes. right? So yeah. that that is a, a very visceral reaction, but it's one that ha- it cannot be the first step. And if it is, you have to you have to deprogram that stuff. It doesn't make sense for us. I mean, we we have yeah, we, we have a we have a tendency, and I and I was gonna, what I was going to say before is if you ask particularly very professional soldiers, sailors, airmen, et cetera, Marines. Uh, why did you join the military? It's not because I want to go fuck stuff up or I just thought it would be cool. It's usually because I wanted to protect my family, my country. The word protect will come into play more often than not. And I think that's an overarching thing. I mean, it, it, it illustrates the fact that most people know that this is what the purpose of this stuff is, but we just don't live that life. And I, I don't know if it's because it's become too difficult or because we've let uh, you know, just division and hate permeate through much through society and let that become part of our identity, really. I mean, th- think, think about the, the modern political landscape. It is part of people's daily, daily personal identity to dislike one side or dislike the other side. It's, uh, it's insane. And we, if we continue down these paths where we're going to the least common uh, factor or least common denominator and trying to fight, like inter- intersect every single thing, right? and then build a hierarchy of things instead of like what unite what is the thing that we can all agree on and start from there that's a that's a group flow state to me that's yeah, that's I, that's the ultimate to me i i mean to me i i foundationally have i've got one belief it's empathy for all yep. empathy for all people plants animals and ecosystems everything else to me is bullshit that's the only like that's that, that that's where i'm at and um all the divisions are crap too right and what would you say to someone who believes like I was describing before that thinks that empathy is some kind of weakness. It depends on the situation I was in. Right. Cause like, well, I would laugh. Norm, yeah. I mean, like, uh, you know what I mean? I really, it's a ridiculous would, like, thing I, to believe, eventually, yeah. eventually I would start laughing is what would happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Like depending on how, who you were and what the situation was would depend on the level of how much I would try to explain things or help or fix the situation. But if like that wasn't appropriate, I would just start laughing because it's a moronic idea. Isn't like, it? It's just a bad idea. But how, how widely held a belief is that? I mean, I, I tend to think I don't fear is a funny thing fear. There's just so it, it's a fear issue because fear blocks empathy flat out. Right. We've known this for a really, really long time. Yes. Right. The fear blocks perspective taking mm-hmm. it blocks creativity. It blocks, so like all this stuff is a, is a fear question mm-hmm. to me. And, um, you know, how do you sort of de-stress society a little bit? That's the, that's the question I, you know, that's the way I think about it. I, you know, I, when I, if I ran into that situation with empathy, I'd be like, I'd start talking to them about what the hell they're so scared of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's sure. where I'd go with that. Like, I mean, I, I go with that when someone is super rude or angry with me for no apparent reason, my first instinct oh. is to, you know, once they've settle down but like hey what the fuck is wrong dude it's not me obviously you've not you're not getting this upset about whatever the fuck is happening between us right now so what's actually wrong right. and what can i do to help you i yeah. feel like that and then just asking people what they we we like to assume the worst when people are talking to us very frequently instead of just asking hey what did you mean by that or like i i is that what you meant because this is how i feel about it what do you think about that i feel like just having those kind of conversations can benefit us so much. We learn more about each other and we actually solve problems instead of just taking sides and lobbing rocks at each other over and over. It doesn't make and any I sense. Was, so the, when I was a journalist, when I was starting out, one of the things that, um, maybe it's one of the reasons I, you know, was successful in my career, you know, mm-hmm. in that portion of my career, I don't know, but I, I can talk to anybody. Like that I was, I was a bartender from like the time I was like 17 through college, through grads, I could, could put me in a room with anybody. I can talk to anybody. And that, you know, that was my sort of job as a journalist. They would, they would often, for example, it's very hard. It's very difficult sometimes to send a lot of uh, journalists in to have conversations with people on the evangelical right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I like send me into those rooms. Like I'm mm-hmm. fascinated. I'm like, you think the earth is 6,000 years old? Cool. Tell me why. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What Let's about this? this? Yeah. What about this? Yeah. Right. I'm Jewish. You could send me into a room with like Nazi white supremacist skinheads. Mm-hmm. I'm still fascinated. So mm-hmm. you hate me and all my people and you want us dead. Why is that? Right. right. I'm just like, that's fascinating. 
right? So I'm really good at those conversations. And I will tell you that after being in every room and talking to everybody, this is what I believe, as far as I can tell. First of all, I've, very, I've met very few stupid people. What I've met is a lot of people who speak different languages. But if you figure out what somebody's passionate about and what mm -hmm. language they speak, everybody's smart about something. Right, yeah, yeah. So I usually start there. I figure out what are you smart about? What are you really into? What can I learn from you about? And then let's talk about some of the hard things. Let's find a little yeah. common ground first. That's really And then we can go to the hard things. Have you, um, uh, have you ever read um, Ender's Game and Speaker for the Dead oh, in that yeah. series of books? Orson so, Hart, Orson yeah, Hart, yeah, we actually had Orson on the show about a year ago. And I, oh, I, I yeah, it was great. He's, he's such a brilliant writer. Uh, and I asked him about that. Uh, you know, towards the end of, uh, spoiler alert, it's been out for 30 years, assholes, read the book. But uh, <laughs> towards the end of the book, um, in Ender's Game, when he starts talking to the Hive Queen, right, he understands that from the Hive Queen's perspective, killing all those humans, that wasn't an act of violence. That was just like knocking on the door, right? They're just trying to establish communication because in their society, that's not a big deal. They, they're a hive mind. So losing a little bit of that is like losing some skin cells, right? That's not a big deal to them. And then the Pecaninos in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Speaker for the Dead and all that stuff and how they were miscommunicating and stuff like that. It really, that's one of the most, that, I, I got to be honest, that is one of the foundational books that I've read as an adult because I was at war at the time when I read the goddamn book. I was like, holy oh, shit. Wow. And, I, and I actually made a post on uh, the old interwebs the other day that says something to the effect of, uh, I had more in common with the men we killed in combat than I have in common with the politicians who sent us there. And that, uh, that, that really made me. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, flat out true it's, on that one. It's completely yeah. true. And how, what does that say? And I, I say this all the time on the show. Uh, if there are 10% of assholes and wherever the Middle East or Russia or wherever, and 10% of assholes here in the United States that want to fight each other and cause conflict. My enemy is not the people of the Middle East or the people of Russia. My enemy are these 20% of assholes that are trying to start conflicts all the time because it's unnecessary. We don't, we don't have, we, this is completely stupid that we're doing this. And why, for what reason? It's ultimately for power and control, obviously. I mean, everybody knows that, but that's too broad of an answer to just tackle alone. And I feel like we get, it's such a big issue that people just give up frequently. And uh, that's, that's too bad. But to your point about the empathy thing and why I've mentioned Orson uh, Scott Card's books, uh, I, I always, when everybody, anybody makes that, or makes that, uh, that point, I like to think about marriage equality and how that happened. People started to, like it became an issue and people were fighting over it and blah, blah, blah. But then famous people, started to come out of the closet and then ordinary people started to come out and people realized that, Oh, my brother is gay or my cousin's a lesbian or whatever they're, And they realized, Oh, they're just a person. They're a good person. That's just some characteristic about them. They're like, Oh, I get it now. And it's that personal experience. And you can't get that in a fucking silo. You can't get it by censoring people or shutting them down or canceling them. The only way that bad ideas get exposed are with good ideas in conversation. That's the only way. And with empathy, obviously, you can't, we, we also have this tendency to dance on each other's graves. Anytime we're right about something, we spike the football and fucking fuck you, buddy. You know, what, what did you achieve by doing that? You just made yourself look like an asshole, one. And two, you completely, I mean, look, that's the Trump presidency, right? He got a lot of things right politically, but he wouldn't shut his fucking mouth. So no one cared if he was right or not at the end of the day. What do we, is that what we want to be as human beings? Like the kind of person that does have some right answers, but because we're such cunts, no one will listen to us. That seems really stupid to me. It's like pissing in the wind, right? Yeah, I like, I just don't think you get to lie. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? You do, mm -hmm. like, I, like, I don't know any other way to say it, but like, um, tell me the fucking hard truth. Mm. Don't lie to me. I'm an adult. <laughs> well, people, you can, you can feel it. People can sniff out bullshit. So, well, I mean, that's why we're still alive as a species is because of our ability to, to recognize and organize patterns and then, you know, uh, uh, build schema to deal with that, whatever they happen to be. And when you bullshit people constantly, even the dullest people at some point are going to be like, wait a minute, that's not true. You just said some shit that's not true. Uh, you know, and it's, I agree with you. Uh, if you read Ray Dalio's principles, uh, he talks about radical transparency. Now you got to be polite and tactful probably through most of that, but just telling people the way things are. I mean, imagine you go to a doctor and you've got a growth, a lump or something like that. And he's like, oh, you know, 
and, and there's three doctors in the room and they're disagreeing in a very argumentative way about what that might be instead of just running tests and finding out. That would be completely unacceptable. But for some reason, we can do that with economics and immigration and everything else, right? Like it's, life can be gray sometimes, but there are correct answers to a lot of stuff. And the, the constant division and debate that we have is, is, it's making me lose my mind. I don't understand why people are so drawn to this stuff. Why are we so conflict driven still at this point in our evolution? It doesn't make sense to me. Well, that's, I mean, that's the one question that I, you know, why hmm. here in the 21st century, first, is violence even acceptable? Yeah. yeah. I mean, right? We have been around for millions of years hmm. at this point. We've been Homo sapiens for 200,000. Hmm. We've been civilized for somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years, we've invented, you know, music, television, art, and Lady Gaga. <laughs> and we still think violence is acceptable. Like yeah. that's still an acceptable way to solve problems in the 21st century. What the fuck? Yeah, it's, it's really bizarre. I mean, I like the, uh, the rough men I sleep peaceably at night because rough men stand ready to do violence. There's a, there, there, we do have to protect ourselves, but the idea that casual violence and, and things like that, uh, that aren't related to the defense, uh, like violence that's not related to the defense of something to me has no place in this world whatsoever. Not for humanity. Goddamn, how, how long is it going to take? What's going to have to happen for us to stop doing that shit? It doesn't make like we're right. we're fighting over resources in some cases. That is un completely unacceptable well, in today's world. Completely unacceptable because one way or the other, the solution to that problem has to be go out and make resources, right? It's yeah. gotta be innovative. Yeah. Like there's no like <laughs> fighting over dwindling resources, like it is they're gonna dwindle. Yeah. Whether it's yeah, yeah. you or your children or your like, come on. Let's get cooperative, get innovative. That's what we do as a species. That's why we're here. That's what flow appears to be, you know, on a certain level designed for to literally help us innovate our way out of problems. We don't have to solve scarcity problems through violence. Right, of course. Well, this has been great. I want to hear about the new book. Tell me about the new book because I haven't had a chance to read Art, it yet. It's called The Art of Impossible, and it is a peak performance primer. It's the first how-to. I've been studying peak performance for 30 years. And it's, um, you know, I liked it. It's, all, it's the first, I think, how-to book anybody has actually written about flow, but it's also the bigger picture. It's because flow is necessary for peak performance, but not uh, sufficient, right? right? There's a bunch of motivational skills. There's a bunch of learning skills. There's some creativity skills. There's, there's a bunch of things that um, support, you know, the, the peak performance that you get from flow. So Art Impossible, I think, is the full book that's written, been written about the kind of the full sequence. And the way I say it is this. Peak performance is nothing more or less than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. Right. That's all it is. And that biology is a, actually it's a limited set of skills, a bunch of motivation skills that get you into the game. There's a bunch of learning skills that allow you to continue to play creativity skills that allow you to steer and flow skills that allow you to turbo boost the results mm. beyond all expectation. That's it. That's cognitive peak performance. And it's actually because we're evolved in a certain way, our biology is designed to work in a certain order in a certain sequence. And if you do things in that order, it's not you can do it out of order and still get your get best, get good results. But if you do things in that order, you get a lot farther, a lot faster. Pardon the alliteration, but with a, mm. a lot less fuss. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I mean, it seems like to me, um, you started out with a question with the uh, rise of Superman and then uh, started some treatment with stealing fire. And now you're starting the physical therapy for lack of a better phrase with this new book. And it's like, you, you know, by the way, there's a bunch of, uh, so, um, if you want to back it up, if you go back mm -hmm. to the small furry prayer, yeah, yeah, yeah. that looks at the evolution of flow, right? So that's right. the relationship between humans and animals. And then West of Jesus is flow and spiritual experience. Right. You so know, I've, I've, I've actually read, I've read that one too. And I, uh, Wow. I think so it, you meant it when you said you've read all the books. Oh, yeah, yeah. You really I think, have read all the books. Wow. I'm pretty sure I've, I've, I don't know if I read this or if I heard it, uh, where Sam Harris, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, neuroscientist and, and, and I guess a philosopher, I don't know what really what you would call him, but he talked about some of that work and how the parallels between, uh, prayer and meditation and just mindfulness all like you were talking about before that you get a lot of the same physiological effects from these different methodologies well pe people say that uh prayer is good for you they're absolutely correct when that's when they're saying that but it's 
meditation is also you don't have to believe in any kind of supernatural force to get the benefits out of this stuff. And a lot of people feel a lot of people confuse meditation with like, oh, that's just some that's some yoga thing or that's some Eastern thing. Or they think about prayer and think this is Western Christianity or this is Islam or something like that. It's not the case at all. It's more about it's a more about using techniques to get the, the, uh, the desired physiological effect. Right. And they all seem to work at about the same rate, which is super interesting. So again, I, I look back and say, all these people are trying to find their place in the world and, 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 and then find you know, uh, Maslow's hierarchy and trying to satisfy these needs and stuff like that. And we think we're antagonistic towards each other, but every, the more and more research we do, the more we find out that all the different disparate strategies we've been using are actually doing the same goddamn thing. And that is super interesting to me. It seems well, like just, just that being in law the same way. I tell, I tell people this all the time. If you're a peak performer, meaning you're top 30%, let's say, if whatever it is the fuck you do, I don't care. The techniques that are in that book, you're using some of them, right? Like when, when peak performers read the book, they're like, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Oh, I didn't know this was part of this, but it, right? Like it's, cause it's a limited toolkit. The biology works a certain way. Peak performance works a certain way. Like, of course there's overlap, right? right? Like, I agree that people think one way or the other, but like from a common sense biological, like good thing there's overlap. You know what I mean? Like it'd be really surprising if these things were doing wildly different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then we, yeah, yeah. We'd have yeah. to like write, reinvent the laws of physics right. and biology. And right then we'd have a puzzle but like the stuff you're talking about is actually, you know, confirmation. But I will say, um, I got to jump in a minute because uh, yeah, yeah. I'm running late. But uh, I will say my first, it's worth pointing this out. So my first mentor mm. in neuroscience was Dr. Andrew Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Andy uh, got famous for doing some of the first imaging studies on mm. Franciscan nuns and Tibetan Buddhists who were experiencing uh, oneness with everything, what's known right. as cosmic unity, right? Mm. And I met Andrew because this is really common in, in flow, right? Like surfers become one with the wave or dudes mm. in combat become one with their brothers, right? Like right, we, right. we have these experiences. And so I wanted to know, hey, this spiritual experience these nuns and, and Buddhists are having, could it be the same thing that like the military guys and right. the action sport athletes are having? And, you know, turns out the answer was yes, and the, which we now know. But what Andrew said something that I always thought was really key and like important from a humility perspective and it's worth i think saying is that look all the work we do we've looked at you know let's say there's a thousand so-called mystical or spiritual experiences at this point like 950 of them we've figured out the biology underneath them right we know why they are there there's a bunch of them there's a handful of them we don't know what they are maybe they're nothing maybe everybody's making it up right she, yeah. for example you hear right. that yeah, 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 yeah. your energy, yeah, yeah. right? Everybody talks about it. Nobody knows how, to, like, maybe our measurement tools aren't accurate enough, maybe, or maybe it, you're making the shit up. And it's yeah, real thing, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like one <laughs> thing or other, but what Andrews always said that I thought was so key um, that I tried to live by is like, it doesn't matter how much research we do, how smart we get, nothing we do is going to answer a bigger why question. It's not going right. to tell you, does God exist or not? Mm. God exists, God indicates these experiences are produced by our biology. And if God doesn't exist, well, these experiences are produced by our biology. That's all we know, right? right. We can't, there's no bigger answer here to the life's deeper philosophical questions. And I think it's arrogant to try to say you have that answer. Yeah, of course. I is, like yeah. the mystery. I yeah. like not knowing. I think it it's is, interesting. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time today. Today, our, now's the point of the show we get to the Drinker Bro of the Week. It's somebody who inspired you on the come up and, and helped guide your life a little bit. It sounds like you might have a choice there with the, with the professor, but anybody you want to give a oh, shout yeah, out to? Oh, Dr., yeah, Dr. Andrew Newberg. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of people. I got to give a shout to um, Rich Divini, who was, uh, you know, my, my friend in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the teams in the Special Forces. Mm -hmm. He was the commander of Dab Grew. Yep. Um, he's, he's been really important. John Barth was my first writing mentor when I was in graduate school. I got to give a shout out to him. So, you know, and always, of course, my wife, who's just always a, a absolutely inspiration yeah. to me. Great. Well, thanks for time today. Hopefully, uh, I'm going to go read your book, and uh, hopefully, we can have you again on sometime in the in the near future Love when to your do that. next project Happy comes to come out. Back. All right. Thanks a lot, man. Have thanks, a good man. night. My pleasure. Bye bye.